Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman, dated 1869. Life of Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman, known at various times and in various places by very many different names, such as Moses, in allusion to her being the leader and guide to so many people of in their access from the land of bondage, the conductor of the Underground Railroad, and Molly Pitcher, for energy and daring by which she delivered a fugitive slave who was about to be dragged back to the South, was for the first 25 years of her life a slave on the eastern shore of Maryland. Her own master she represents as never unnecessarily cruel. But, as was common amongst slaveholders, he often hired out his slaves to others, some of whom proved to be tyrannical and brutal to the utmost limit of their power. She had worked only as a field hand for many years, following the oxen, loading and unloading wood, and carrying heavy burdens, by which she, naturally remarkable power of muscle, was developed that her feet of strength often called forth the wonder of strong and laboring men. Thus was she prepared for the life of hardship and endurance which lay before her, for the deeds of daring she was to do, and of which her ignorant and darkened mind at that time never dreamed. The first person by whom she was hired was a woman who, though married and the mother of a family, was still Miss Susan to her slaves, as is customary at the South. This woman was possessed of the good things of this life and provided liberally for her slaves as far as food and clothing went. But she had been brought up to believe and to act upon that belief that a slave could be taught to do nothing and would do nothing but under the sting of the whip. Harriet, then a young girl, was taken from her life in the field and having never seen the inside of a house better than a cabin in the Negro quarters was put to housework without being told how to do anything. The first thing was to put a parlor in order, move these chairs and tables in the middle of the room, sweep the carpet clean, then dust everything and put them back in their places. These were the directions given and Harriet was left alone to do her work. The whip was in sight on the mantelpiece as a reminder of what was to be expected. swept with all her strength, raising a tremendous dust. The moment she had finished sweeping, she took her dusting cloth and waved everything so you could see your face in them, she had shown so. In haste to go and set the table for breakfast and do her other work, the dust which she had set flying only settled down again on chairs, tables, and the piano. Miss Susan came in and looked around. Then came the call for Minty. Harriet's name was... Uh, Aramintia, A R A M I N T A, at the south. She drew her up to the table, saying, "What do you mean by doing my work this way, you?" And passing her finger on the table and piano, she showed her the mark it made through the dust. Miss Susan, I done swept and dust just as you told me, but the whip was already taken down. The strokes were falling on my head, and face and neck. Four times the scene was repeated before breakfast, when, during the fifth whipping, the door opened and Miss Emily came in. She was a married sister of Miss Susan, and was making her visit, and though brought up with the same associations as her sister, seems to have been a person of more gentle and reasonable nature. Not being able to endure the screams of a child any longer, she came in, told her, took her sister by the arm, and said, If you do not stop whipping th that child, it will leave your house and never come back. Miss Susan declared that she would not mind, and she cited her work on purpose. Miss Emily said, Leave her to me a few moments. And Miss Susan left the room indignant. As soon as they, they were gone alone, Miss Emily said, Now, Minty, show me how you do your work. For the sixth time, Harriet moved all the furniture to the middle of the room. Then she swept, and the moment she was done sweeping, she took the dusting cloth to wipe off the furniture. Now stop there, said Miss Emily. Go away now and do some of your other work, and when it is time to dust, I will call you. When the time came, she called her and explained to her how the dust had now settled, and that if she waved it off now, the furniture would remain bright and clean. These few words an hour or two before would have saved Harriet her whipping for that day, 
as they probably did for many a day after. Well, with this woman, after working from early morning till late at night, she was obliged to sit up all night to rock a cross sick child. Her mistress laid upon her bed with a whip under her pillow and slept. But if the tired nurse forgot herself for a moment, if her weary head dropped and her hand ceased to rock the cradle, the child would cry out, and then down would come the whip upon the neck and face of the poor weary creature. The scars are still plainly visible, with the whip cut into the flesh. Perhaps her mistress was preparing her, though she did not know it then, by this enforced habit of wakefulness, for the many long nights of travel, when she was the leader and guide of the weary and hunted ones who were escaping from bondage. Miss Susan got tired of Harriet, as Harriet was determined she should do, and so abandoned her intention of buying her and sent her back to her master. She was next hired out to a man who inflicted upon her the lifelong injury from which she is suffering now by breaking her skull with the weight from the scales. The injury thus inflicted causes her often to fall into a state of solemnity from which it is almost impossible to rouse her. Disabled and sick, her flesh all wasted away, she is returned to her owner. He tried to sell her, but no one would buy her. Day after day, wouldn't give me sixpence for me, she said. And so, she said, from Christmas till March, I worked as I could, and I prayed through all the long nights. I groaned and prayed for old master. O oh Lord, convert master. O oh Lord, convert that man's heart. Pairs like I prayed all them times, said Harriet. Bob my work everywhere. I prayed and I groaned to the Lord. When I went to the horse trough to wash my face, I took up the water into my hands, and I said, O oh Lord, wash me, make me clean. Then I take up something to wipe my face, and say, O oh Lord, wipe away all my sin. When I took the broom and began to sweep, I groaned, O oh Lord, what do you ever sin there be in my heart? Sweep it out, Lord, clear and clean. No words can describe the pathos of her tones, as she broke out into these words of prayer, after the manner of her people. And so, she said, I prayed all night long for Master, till the first of March, and all the time he was bringing people to look at me and trying to sell me. Then we heard that some of us was going to be sold to go windy chain gang down to the cotton and rice fields, and they said I was uh, going on uh, my brothers as sister. Then I changed my prayers. First of March I began to pray, O oh Lord, if you ain't never going to change that man's heart, kill him, Lord, and take him out of that way. Next thing I heard, old master was dead, and he died just as he lived. Oh, then it appeared like I gave all the world full of gold if I had it to bring that poor soul back, but I couldn't pray for him no longer. The slaves were told that their master's will provided that none of them should be sold out of the state. That satisfied most of them, and they were very happy. But Harriet was not satisfied. She never closed her eyes, that she did not imagine she saw the horsemen coming, and heard the screams of women and children as they were being dragged away to a far worse slavery than they were enduring here. Harriet was married at that time to a free Negro, who not only did not trouble himself about her fears, but did his best to bury her and bring her back after she escaped. She would start at night with the cry, Oh, it's am coming, they're coming, I must go. Her husband called her a fool and said she was like old Cujo, who, when a joke went round, never laughed a half hour after everybody else got through. And so just as all the dangers passed, she began to be frightened. But still Harriet and her f fancy saw the horseman coming and heard the screams of terrified women and children. And all that time, in my dreams and visions, she said, I seemed to see a line, and on the other side of that line were green fields and lovely grasses and flowers and beautiful white ladies who stretched out their arms to me over the line, but I couldn't reach them no how. I always fell before I got to the line. On Saturday, Saturday it was whispered in the quarters that two of Harriet's sisters had been sent off with a chain gang. That morning she started having persuaded three of her brothers to accompany her. But they had not gone far when the brothers, appalled by the dangers before and behind them, determined to go back, and in spite of her remonstrations, dragged her with them. In fear and terror, she remained over Sunday, and on Monday night, a negro from another part of the plantation came privately to tell Harriet that herself and brothers were to be carried off that night. The poor old mother, who belonged to the same mistress, was just going to milk. Harriet wanted to get away without letting her know. 
because she knew that she would raise an uproar and prevent her going, or insist upon going with her, and the time for this was not yet. But she must give some invitation to those she was going to leave on her intentions and set a farewell as she might to friends and relations on the plantation. These communications were generally made by singing. They sang as they walked along the country roads, and the quiet chorus was taken up by others, and the uninitiated knew not the hidden meaning of the words. Where the old chariot comes, I go in to leave you. I bound to the promised land, I go in to leave you. These words meant something more than a journey to the heavenly Canaan. Harriet said, Here, mother, go along. I do the milking tonight and bring it in. The old woman went to her cabin. Harriet took down her sunbonnet and went on to the big house where some of her relatives lived as house servants. She thought she could trust Mary, but there were others in the kitchen and she could not say anything. Mary, Mary began to frolic with her. She threw her across the, the kitchen and ran out, knowing that Mary would follow her. Uh, but just as they turned the corner of the house, the master to whom Mary, Harriet was now hired came riding up on his horse. Mary darted back, and Harriet thought there was no way now but to sing. But the doctor, as the master was called, was regarded with special awe by his slaves. If they were singing or talking together in the field or on the road, and the doctor appeared, all was hushed till he passed, but Harriet had no time for ceremony. Her friends must have a warning, and whether the doctor thought her impertinent or not, she must sing him farewell. So on she went to meet him, singing, I'm sorry I'm going to leave you, farewell, oh farewell, but I'll meet you in the morning, farewell, oh farewell. The doctor passed, and she bowed as she went on singing still. I'll meet you in the morning, I'm bound to the promised land, on the other side of Jordan, bound to the promised land. She reached the gate and looked around. The doctor had stopped his horse and had turned around in the saddle, was looking at her as if there might be more in this than meet the ear. Harry closed the gate, went on a little way, came back. The doctor was still gazing at her. She lifted up the gate as if she had not latched it properly, waved her hand to him, and burst it out again. I'll meet you in the morning, safe to the promised land, on the other side in Jordan, bound for the promised land. And as she started on her journey, not knowing whether she went, except that she was going to follow the North Star till the letter to Liberty. Cautiously and by night she traveled, cunningly feeling her way, and finding out who were friends, till, after a long and painful, painful journey, she found, in answer to careful inquiries, that she had at last crossed that magic line, which then separated the land of bondage from the land of freedom. For this was before we were commanded by law to take part in the inquiry of slavery, in aid in taking and sending back those poor haunted fugitives who had manhood and intelligence enough to enable them to make their way thus far towards freedom. When I found I had crossed this line, she said, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields, and I felt like I was in heaven. But then came the bitter dew in the cup of joy. At least 25 years he was thinking of his home and longing for the time he would see it again. At last the day comes, he leaves the prison gates. He makes his way to his old home, but his old home is not there. The house has been pulled down, a new one has been put up in its place. His family and friends are gone, nobody knows where. There is no one to take him by the hand, no one to welcome him. So it was with me, she said. I had crossed the line. I was free. But there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land, and my home, after all, was down in Maryland, because my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and friends were there. But I was free, and they should be free. I would make a home in the north and bring them there, God helping me. Oh, how I prayed then, she said. I said to the Lord, I'm going to hold, to hold steady unto you, and I know you'll see me through. She came to Philadelphia and worked in hotels and clubhouses and afterwards at Cape May. Whenever she had raised enough money to pay expenses, she would make her way, hide herself in various ways, give notice to those who were ready to strike for freedom. When her party was made up, then she would start always on Saturday night, because advertisements would not be sent out on Sunday, which gave them one day in advance. Then the pursuers would start after them. 
advertisements would be posted everywhere. There was one reward for $12,000 offered for the head of the woman who was constantly appearing and enticing away parties of slaves from their master. She had traveled in the, in the cars when these posters were put up over her head, and she heard them read by those about her, for she could not read herself. Fearlessly, she went on, trusting in the Lord. She said, I started with this idea in my head. There's two things I got a right to, and these two are death and, or liberty, one or the other, I mean to have. No one will take me back alive. I shall fight for my liberty, and when the time has come, and acting upon this simple creed and firm in this trusting faith, she went back and forth, 19 times according to the reckoning of her friends. She remembers that she went 11 times from Canada, but on the other journey she kept no reckonings. While Harry was working as a cook in one of the large hotels of Philadelphia, the play of Uncle Tom's Cabin was being performed for many weeks every night. Some of her fellow servants wanted her to go and see it. No, said Harriet, I ain't got no heart to go and see the sufferings of my people played on this stage. I heard Uncle Tam Tom's cabin bread, and I tell you, Miss Thoreau's pen has begun to paint what slavery is, as I have seen it in the far south. I've seen the real thing, and I don't want to see it on a stage or in no theater. I will give here a... Uh, article from a paper published nearly a year ago which mentioned the price set upon the head of Harriet was much higher than I have stated it to be. When asked about this, Harriet said she did not know whether it was so, but she heard them read from the paper that the reward was $12,000. Among American women, says the article referred to, who has shown a courage and self-devotion to the welfare of others equal to Harriet Tubman, hear her story and going down again and again into the very jaws of slavery to rescue her suffering people, bring them all through perils and dangers enough to appall the stoutest heart till she was known among them as Moses. $40,000 was not too great a reward for the Maryland slaveholders to offer for her. Think of her brave spirit as strong as Daniel's of old in its fearless purpose to serve God, even through the fierce furnace she should be her portion. I have looked into her dark face and I wondered and admired as I listened to the thrilling deeds her lion heart had prompted her to dare. I have heard their groans and sighs and seen their tears, and I would give every drop of blood in my veins to free them, she said. The other day at um, Gerrit's, G-E-R-R-I-T, Smith's, I saw this heroic woman whom the pen of genius will yet make famous as one of the noblest Christian's hearts ever inspired to lift the burdens of the wrong and oppressed, and what do you think she said to me? She had been tending and caring for our Union black and white soldiers in hospital during the war, and at the end of her labors was on her way home, coming in a car through New Jersey. A white man, the conductor, thrust her out of the car with such violence that she was not able to work scarcely any sense. And she told me of the pain she had and still suffered. She said she did not know what she should have done for herself and the old father and mother she takes care of, Mr. Uh, Whittendell, Whittendell Phillips, had not sent her $60 that kept her warm through the winter. She had a letter from W.H. Seward uh, to Major General Hunter in which she says, I have known her long and a nobler and higher spirit, a truer seldom dwells in the human form. It will be impossible to give any connected account of the different journeys taken by Harriet for the rescue of her people, as she herself has no idea of the dates commenced with them or of the order in which they were made. She thinks she was about 25 when she made her first own escape, and this was in the last year of James K. Polk's administration. From that time to the beginning of the war, her years were spent in these journeys back and forth with intervals between, in which she worked only to spend the avails of her labor in providing for the wants of her next party of fugitives. By night she traveled many times on foot, over mountains, through forests, across rivers, mid pearls by land, pearls by waters, pearls by enemies, pearls among false brethren. Sometimes members of her own party would become exhausted for a certain foot sore and bleeding, declare they could not go on.
the rewards posted up everywhere had been, at first, $500 for Joe, if taken within the limits of the United States, then 1000 then $1,500, and all expenses clear and clean for his body in Easton Jail. 800 for William and 400 for Peter. 1200 for the woman who enticed them away. The long Williamston Bridge was guarded by police officers and the advertisements were everywhere. The party was scattered and taken to houses of different colored friends and word was sent secretly to Tom Garrett of Williamton of their condition and the necessity of their being taken across the bridge. Tom Garrett is a quarterman and a man of a wonderfully large and generous heart, through whose hands, Harriet tells me, 2,000 self-emancipated slaves passed on their way to freedom. He was always ready in um, heart and hand and means in aiding these poor fugitives and rendered most efficient help to Harriet down her many of her journeys back and forth. A letter received a few days since by the writer from this noble-hearted philanthropist will be given presently. As soon as Tom Garrett heard of the condition of these poor people, his plan was formed. He engaged two wagons, filled them with bricklayers, whom, of course, he paid well for their share in the enterprise and sent them across the bridge. They went as if on a frolic, singing and shouting. The guards saw them pass and, of course, expected them to recross the bridge. After nightfall, and fortunately it was a dark night, the same wagons went back but with an addition to their party. The fugitives were on the bottom of the wagons and the bricklayers on the seats, still singing and shouting, and so they passed by the guards who were entirely unsuspected of the nature of the load the wagon contained or of the amount of property thus escaping their hands, and so they made their way to New York. When they entered the anti-slavery office there, Joe was recognized at once by the description of the advertisement. Well, said Mr. Oliver Johnson, I am glad to see the man whose head is worth fifteen hundred dollars. At this, Joe's heart sank. If the advertisement had gone to New York, that place which it had taken them so many days and nights to reach, he thought he was still in danger. And how far is it now to Canada, he asked, when told how many miles for they were to come through New York State and cross the suspension bridge, he was ready to give up. From that time, Joe was silent, said Harriet. He sang no more. He talked no more. He sat with his head in his hand, and nobody could use him or make him take any interest in anything. They passed along in safety, and at length found themselves in the cars approaching the suspension bridge. The rest were very joyous and happy, but Joe sat silent and sad. Their fellow prisoners all seemed interested in and for them, and listened with tears as Harriet and other party lifted up their voices and sang, I'm on my way to Canada, that cold and dreary land, the sad effects of slavery, I can no longer stand. I've served my master all my days, without a dime's reward, and now I'm forced to run away, to flee the lash abroad. Farewell, O master, don't think hard of me, I'll travel on to Canada, where all the slaves are free. The hounds are baying on my track, O master comes behind, resolve that he will bring me back before I cross the line. I am now embarked for yonder shore, there a man's a man by law, the iron horse will bear me over to shake the lion's paws. O righteous father, wilt thou not pity me, and aid me on to Canada, where all the slaves are free? O I heard Queen Victoria say, that if we would forsake our native land of slavery, and come across the lake, that she was standing on the shore, while arms expended wide, to give us all a peaceful home, beyond the rolling tide, farewell, O master, etc. The cars began to cross the bridge. Harry was very anxious to have her companions see the falls. William, Peter, and Eliza came eagerly to look at the wonderful sight, but Joe sat still, with his head in his hand. Joe, come and look at the falls. Joe, you fool! You gotta look at these falls. It's your last chance. But Joe sat still and never raised his head. At length, Harriet knew by the rise of the center of the bridge and the descent on the other side that he had crossed the line. She sprang across to Joe's seat, took him with all her might, and shouted, Joe, you've shook the lion's paws. Joe did not know what she meant. Joe, you're free, shouted Harriet. Then Joe's head went up. He raised his hands on high in his face, screaming with tears to heaven, and broke out in loud and thrilling tones. Glory to God and Jesus, too. One more soul is safe. O oh, go and carry the news. One more soul got safe. Joe, come and look at your falls, cried Harriet. Glory to God and Jesus too. One more soul got safe was all the answer. 
The car stopped at the other side. Joe's feet were the first to touch the British soil after those of the conductors. Loud roared the waters of Niagara, but louder still, ascended the anthem of praise from the overflowing heart of the free man. And can we doubt that the strain was taken up by angel voices, and that through the arches of heaven echoed and re-echoed re the strain. Glory to God in the highest, glory to God in Jesus too. One more soul is safe. The ladies and gentlemen gathered round him, and Harriet said, Till I can't see Joe for the crowd, only I heard. Glory to God and Jesus too, louder than ever. William went after him and pulled him, saying, Joe, stop your noise, you act like a fool. Then Peter ran and jerked his mose off his feet. Joe, stop your howling. Fools think you, folks, I think you're crazy. But Joe gave no heed. The ladies were crying, and tears like rain ran down Joe's stable cheeks. A lady reached over her fine a handkerchief to him. Joe wept his face, and then he spoke. Oh, if I felt like this to the south, it would uh, have taken nine men to take me. Only one more journey for me now, and that is to heaven. Well, you old fool, you, said Harriet, with whom there seems but one step from the sublime to the ridiculous. You might uh, looking at the falls first, and then gone to heaven afterwards. She has seen Joe several times since, a happy and industrious free man in Canada, and when asked, she often it uh, is how it was possible that she was not afraid to go back with that tremendous price upon her head. Harriet always answered, Why don't I thank you, Mrs. It wasn't me, twas the Lord. I always told him I trust to you. I don't know where to go or what to do, but I expect you to lead me, and he always did. At one time she was going down, watched for everywhere. After there had been a meeting of slaveholders in the courthouse, although one of the largest cities in Maryland, and an added reward had been put upon her head with various threats of different cruel devices by which she would be tortured and put to death. Friends gathered around her, imploring her not to go on directly in the face of danger and death. This was Harriet's answer to them. Now, look, year. John saw the city, didn't he? Yes, John saw the city. Well, what did he see? He saw twelve gates. Three of his gates was on the north, three of them on the east. Three of them in the south, too. And I reckon if they kill me down here, I'll get into one of them gates, don't you? Whether Harriet's idea of geographical bearing of the gates of the celestial city as seen in the apostolic vision were correct or not, we cannot doubt that she was right in the deduction her faith drew from them, and that somewhere, whether north, south, east, or west, to our dim vision, there is a gate to be opened for Harriet, where the welcome will be given. Come in. Thou blessed of my father. Many of the st stories told by Harriet in answer to questions have been collaborated by letters, some of you, which will appear in this book. Leaving off on page 37.